rock on. Hello, I am Francois René Rideau, and uh, today we are going to bind blockchains together with accountability through computability logic. So what is it all about? I want uh, you to have these four points, that we should take the analogy of consensus as core seriously, because it can solve scaling issues, interoperability issues, and all, all sorts of distributed application issues. Another point, so this point, the guys from Plasma make it very well on Ethereum. My second point is that contracts are to not evaluate code on the blockchain. If you think that contracts are to evaluate code on the blockchain, you are misled. And also that current contract languages are way too low level. Even those that use uh, functional programming that are great and much better than those that don't, they are still way too low level and you must use formal methods. This uh, picture, uh, this talk will give you a big picture, but it's not completely uh, vaporware like some of my other software. This is not vaporware, we have three full-time developers. There is myself, there is Paul Steckler and Alex Coventry. And if we get funding, maybe we can have more people. Hey, has anyone got a few million dollars, please? Um, <laughs> the current status, we are working uh, on a mock on Ethereum, and we hope to make it less of a mock uh, in the next few months. And if you want to see the code, it will be released at free software, but not yet. So right now, you need to, uh, we need to add your uh, GitLab account to the repo. First problem, scaling issue. The throughput of Bitcoin is about seven transactions per second compared to thousands for credit cards. Latency, 60 minutes for Bitcoin, 30 for Ethereum. It's not going to improve much uh, anytime soon. And uh, this is too little and too slow for casual payments. You can buy a house or a car this way, but you can probably not uh, fill your car tank with gas or buy uh, flowers for your mother when you're late at her birthday. The usual solution well, with uh, f government currencies, you use fast payment via payment cards. And actually, it used to be that you used to write checks, and the checks took like weeks to, to clear. And in the back end of uh, payment card processors, it still takes days or weeks to clear, but the payment is authorized in a few seconds. So why can't we do just the same thing for cryptocurrencies? Well, people would say the, these solutions with fiat currencies are too centralized. I would argue that the problem is not exactly they are too centralized, it's that they are too custodial. But we'll go back to that. Consensus as court. So why do we even need a distributed consensus? If everyone is honest and everyone is competent, they, they, they write a check and their word is gold, you don't even need to clear it. You, this guy promised me this thing, I can give it to someone else, etc. I can pass it along. It, it's gold, no problem. But sometimes people are dishonest or incompetent or make mistakes, and then you should, you should definitely clear your check and, and bank them before uh, the resources go away or claimed by someone else. And the consensus is a mechanism that allows you to do exactly that. You can register your claims so that now I'm the first claimant for this title, so it's mine, and it's clear to everyone that it's mine. And in case there is any dispute, we can resolve the dispute by saying, yeah, this person is right or that person is right. So the consensus is very akin to a court system, that the system we use in, in the human law to prevent and resolve disputes. And there's a reason why it's slow and expensive, because everyone, the whole world around, has to agree on it. So maybe we can make it faster than it is now, but there's an essential reason why it's essentially slow. And if you want to have consensus between here and Mars, for instance, international, uh, interplanetary uh, Bitcoin, it's not going to happen. Or it will be very slow. So you don't go to court for causal payment. Yes, you buy a house or a car by going to court, but when you buy a coffee, you don't. You do, once again, casual payment with pay payment processors because it scales. They are centralized actors that can authorize things in a few seconds, even though in the back end it still takes weeks. So we could do that with uh, payment cards for Ethereum, say, and it could just work. And you would only go to court to prevent and resolve disputes. There's an analogy between co consensus and court. So in one case, you have participants who are humans or machines. The enforcement can be social or algorithmic. The arbiter can be a judge or this consensus. The register can be a court clerk or an account table. The interpretation of law can be flexible when it's done by humans uh, or rigid when done by machines. It can be 
totally uh, predict unpredictable for with humans or predictable with machines within operating parameters. But there is a clear analogy. Things are different, but there are, there are some, so, some patterns that are the same. And when there's an analogy, since we are functional programmers, we understand that an analogy is one abstraction applied twice to a different set of parameters. So the thing that is common is the abstraction above, and the thing that is different that breaks down the analogy is the different parameters. The common abstraction here is this system for adjudication of titles. And the different parameters is, in one case, it's applied to humans, and in the other case, it's applied to machines. So the two things are not substitutable to the others. What is the same is the thing above that is the abstraction. What law cannot do? Why don't we just make double spending illegal? Well, why don't we just make murder illegal? <laughs> well, murder is illegal, and yet it still happens, even with people who uh, don't wear a uniform. And you just can't decree bad behavior. Uh, all you can do is, what can we do? With, we can um, hold people accountable for the things they do. The law cannot magically make you not do something. But you can change the incentives. You can say, yes, you can still do the thing. I mean, yes, you can physically. But if you do it, bad things will happen to you that you prefer not to happen. So it, the law can change the incentives. And there's uh, this field of study called game theory that studies how incentives matter and how these games, these interactions work, depending on how people prefer or don't prefer various outcomes. And the way that law works is because people have skin in the game. They can lose something uh, precious if they behave really badly, and they can fail to gain something good if they don't do the right thing. And in human law, you just catch the bad guy, and uh, you beat him, you send him to jail, something bad happens to him. But online, no one knows you're a dog, or a god, or whatever. And so that you can't just catch someone. Or maybe sometimes you can, but it's very expensive, very hard. Sometimes you can't. So instead, what you do with crypto law is that the people who cannot be trusted a priori can deposit a collateral, a bond, that will make sure that they are interested in doing the right thing. And this will be a pattern we'll see uh, a lot in crypto law. And that's why uh, when you have proof of stake and slashing, people have to deposit a bond. So there is a whole field dedicated to the economic analysis of law. It's a branch of economics. It studies how law affects the incentives of all participants. It studies the law from the point of view of the consequences and not of the intentions of the law. And it even applies to the lawmakers. There's a branch called public choice theory. And what this economic analysis of law tells us that there is a correspondence between the kinds of freedom that actors have and the alignment of interests between the actors. If there is a manager but you have no freedom except to just shut up and obey with respect to what the manager decides, then the interests between the users and the managers are opposite. And this generates chaos. If you have the, the, the freedom of voice, you can say what you want. You can even vote for it then that can create coordination between people whose interests are already aligned. The problem is, how do you know that their interests are aligned? What if one half of the population votes to enslave the other half, or whatever? If their interests are too disaligned, uh, there is no coordination. There is just war to, 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 to know who will be on top. So the next level of freedom is exit, where you can say, you know what? I'm through with you. Your garbage collecting service is really bad. I'm going to go to your competitor. And that allows to find alignment with inter or of interest within the limited choice of whichever providers are available. And the next level of freedom is enter. You know what? None of the garbage collectors around provide satisfactory service. Hey, I'm going to start my own garbage collection service. Hey, neighbors, what about you join me and we make a company or an association, whatever, and we compete. And this can create alignment and generate order. How does that apply? to managers for payment sidechains. Well, on the blockchain, you have very limited and very slow voice, but you can have unlimited exit and enter to keep the payment processors honest. Exit means that you can repudiate your payment processor. You know what? You are not, you're refusing to process my cards. You are declaring that I'm blocked because I do something. I published uh, the secret of your government. No problem. I'll go to get uh, to another payment processor. And the contract on the blockchain will ensure that I can do it, and you have nothing to say about it. And enter, well, if none of the existing payment processors are honest or 
or if they are all too expensive or whatever, they all dislike my favorite singer, I'll be my own payment processor and I'll invite my friends and everything will, will be fine. So by having exit and enter, we can keep all the payment processors honest, even though there are managers who have um, very large uh, freedom to not, do, to not help you. <coughs> Consensus at court. I think it's a fruitful point of view that is a productive analogy where the consensus provides not uh, only arbitration and you don't do the transaction of the consensus, and then all your transactions can happen fast on the side chain, and you only go to the consensus for the resolve disputes. So how do smart contracts to, to do side chains work? Well, the first good news is that this way we can solve scaling by not publishing the transaction on the main chain, which is a big win. Because non-publication is infinitely faster than publication. While you publish one or 10 million transactions on your chain, I can publish LF0 or LF2 transactions on my chain because I, don't, I, know I cannot publish uh, LF0 transactions on my chain because I'm not publishing them. I cannot publish infinitely many transactions faster than you can publish one. And I still have to register my, my transactions, but I can do that in batch. So I can, while you do one transaction, I can register one million in, in a one batch by publishing just the, the hash. And I still have to publish lawsuits, and lawsuits are, are slow and expensive and take time, and yes, it takes more time than the transaction. But if your interests are acti actually aligned by the system of contracts, then lawsuits will be few and far between, and so you still win. Okay, so sc scaling can be solved with side chains and, and accountability. And non-publication is also for contracts. When I do a contract with two people, well, I, not, I don't need to publish one million lines of 1,000 page of contracts. I can just publish the salted hash of the contract, just the minimum. And I put my collateral, you put your collateral. We each do our thing. We're, we don't have to do it on the blockchain, the main chain. When we all did our things, we settled with, with science a message, hey, let's just get our collateral back and decide, decide that this thing is done. And if and only if one party fails, let's say you fail to do something for me, I will reveal just the one line in, in that thousand page contract that says, hey, you put brown M&Ms in my, in my bowl, so therefore your contract is, uh, uh, is void and you owe me your collateral as reparations. And I don't need to reveal any, anything else than the, of this thousand page contract, I only need to reveal the one line where you failed. And, uh, that's also faster. Don't Bitcoin has this thing called Merkleize AST, Merkleize abstract entry that, that allows to do that. So, not publishing contracts allows to make them more private, faster, cheaper, and smaller. Everything is fine. So, what are contracts for? It's a mechanism to create alignment of interest. We want to, we want to work together, but we don't trust to each other that much. So we will write a contract that says, here's what I'm going to do, here's what you're going to do, and, and that's fine. And the plan A for a contract is never to go to court. If you think the other guy is dishonest and will never do his part, you just say, no, goodbye, uh, stay off my lawn. You only write the contract with someone that you actually care about and to, uh, to do your thing. Just like an employment contract, uh, a leasing contract, whatever kind of contract, the goal of the contract is that we were going to do each of our obligations out of court, but the contract is here to hold us accountable in case we don't. Question. Sorry? So if I'm understanding this correctly, are you saying we should discourage use of smart contracts until it's absolutely necessary? Yeah, just, just like when you write a human contract, your goal is not to go to, to the judge, to, to have the judge do the computation. Right. That, that would be extremely expensive. No, you do, you do your computation off the chain somewhere else, and then you go to the judge only if the other idiot doesn't do his part, or if his computer fails, or for whatever reason he doesn't do his obligation, then you go to the judge and refuse to settle. Maybe he doesn't do his obligation, but you say, okay, let's settle it after court, it will be cheaper. Right, so is it actually more expensive, like in similar analogy to your thing, that it'd be more expensive to try a smart contract in this type of chain? Uh, let's go back to that l later. Okay. But in my view, the goal of the contract is never to go to do the computation of the blockchain. Yeah. It's to threaten the computation of the blockchain, which is one million times more expensive. And computing the blockchain is one million times more expensive than doing it on your computer. But if you're not going to do your, your, uh, the job, 
well, you are going to pay for it. You are going to pay for this million, million times more expensive thing uh, and lose the rest of your collateral. So it's to threaten to do computation on the blockchain, not to do computation on the blockchain. So what do contracts consist in? Mutual obligations. I promise to do X, or else this bad thing happens to me. You promise to do Y, or else this bad thing happens to you. And the bad thing starts usually by losing your collateral. And if someone breaks their promise, the sanction punishes them. Example contract, atomic swap. Let's say you want to exchange a thousand dollar worth of Monero for Zcash. And you can sign an Ethereum contract where each of you will post, a, say, a $4,000 bond. And if you don't do your part, you will lose half of it and give the other half to the, to the other guy. So you'll be punished. And settlement is slow, because you still need a half an hour to settle the, the Ethereum transaction, and about half an hour also for Zcash, or Monero or Zcash, I don't know how, what, what the time is. So settlement will be slow. But as soon as the contract is signed, you're bound. And you know that you'll do the right thing, and the other person knows that he'll do the right thing. So as fast as you can sign this thing, you're bound, and you'll, you can be confident that even if the right thing doesn't happen, you'll be compensated. To the point that you really want to hide behind Tor, because one strategy for the bad guys now is to have you sign this contract and then DDoS you to death so you can't fulfill it. And then they get compensated more in Ethereum than they would get by getting your Zcash or your Monero. So if you're going to sign a contract like that, be sure you have a secondary backup route to the internet in case you're DDoS to death. Okay. Second good news then, we can solve interoperability. You don't need to trust the other person, you just need to trust the software, which is already hard, but at least it can be written by good people sometimes. And the, neither of the currency swaps need to support contracts. Neither of the currency swaps need to have compatible cryptographic primitives. You can just interoperate if it was a good enough smart contract with, in one chain, say Ethereum, you can write interoperability for all the other chains. And if you want to avoid the free option problem, where, for instance, the, the last guy to sign the contract always gets to either sign it or not sign it until it, the contract time, times out, well, you can use a facilitator. And the facilitator will bind you now, and you don't get to not sign. And now the facilitator could uh, try to cheat, but then he will lose all his customers, because now he's a, a, a cheating facilitator. So. We can also swap without a large stake, but not for now. Question, what logic for the contracts? So we want to verify the contracts, and we, we want to have contracts that are algorithmic, that can be verified by a computer, and we need some kind of logic for that. What is the logic that corresponds to that? I, let's go back to what is a legal argument. A legal argument is when two parties disagree about a claim. I will claim that all sheep in Colorado are white, and you will claim otherwise. Each party argues a case, or, and each party has a lawyer that argues the case in front of the court, and at the end, the judge adjudicates the, the claim by saying he, this person is right, and, and he gets compensated, and this person is wrong, and he pays. And in logic, we call that an interactive proof. And there's a theory of interactive proofs called game semantics. Once again, Let's argue that all sheep are, are the same color as mine in Colorado. So I'll argue that, and you argue that Meredith will argue that one of them at least is a different color. So it's a formula of the form, there exists an X, my sheep, such that for all Y, the other sheep, P of X, Y, the color is the same. And by brute force, I could show half a million of those Colorado, Colorado whatever, sheep to the judge. But uh, showing one, half a million sheep to the judge will cost a lot of money because you have to produce each of them in, into court. The judge will start by falling asleep after counting the sheep, and then he will retire and die of old age. And after spending a billion dollars in court fees, you still will not be there. But you can be slightly more clever than that. You can say, hey, the opposite of uh, exist x for all y, p of x, y can be written for all x, there exists a y such as not p of x, y. So, you, the, the knot uh, can be pushed inside, and every time it's pushed inside, uh, an exist becomes a for all, and a for all becomes an exist. And then when I show my, my white sheep, I can't show all the other sheep to say that they're all white, but I can challenge you to show me a sheep that's not white. And if you can show a black sheep, then you win. And if you can't show a black sheep, you show a white sheep, or if you 
time out and fail to show a sheep, then you lose. So in finite time, in this case two steps, we can show, we can prove to a, a judge that yes, indeed, all sheep in Colorado are, are white, or all of my transactions that I signed are honest, or all of whatever are, are, are good, or not, or you can prove me wrong and, and make me lose my stake. So at, I will have an uh, interaction, I exhibit my witness or exhibit yours. For every, uh, there exists, I exhibit a witness. And it's called, in logic as well as in court, it's called a witness. And for every for all, I will challenge you to show your witness, and we exchange roles like that. And there's a finite number of alternations between exists and for all. And therefore, in a finite number of steps, which is determined statically by the formula, the judge will be able to have a closed formula with just uh, witnesses, and he'll be able to evaluate this formula, and, and there. So this is game semantics, and this is uh, interactive proofs. So we can transform any formula into a game, and if the formula is decided, so if the formula, if one side of the formula is provable, then the winner has a good strategy. And if the formula is decidable, then whichever guy is the winner and is the, is the right guy has, has had a winning strategy. And if all quantifiers are over finite data structure and all the primitives are simple, then the good guys win because indeed the formula is decidable. And what is the logic built on game semantics that is the one that I really think is good? It's called computability logic. It's been developed by Georgi Japaridze from Villanova University since 2003. Game semantics is much older than that. But what I like about Japaridze's approach is that he puts game semantics first and syntax second. A lot of people say, hey, here are formulas. Let's try to give game semantics to them. He takes the opposite approach. Here are games. And the games are the primitives in this case. In the case of the judge, the games is exactly the thing we can do with, with uh, the blockchain consensus. So, Here's the games, what can we do with those games? And that's where we go. And game semantics contains fragments of, the, as fragments, classical logic, intuitionistic logic, linear logic, etc. And if that's not enough, you can define your own operations. Because if we go from semantics to syntax, well, just define the game that proves it and see what it proves, and you have a new operator. And for blockchain, we'll have to add the fragments for epistemic logic. This guy knows this key, this guy knows that key. And you have uh, fragments from temporal logic. There is a timeout and things like that. And the properties preserved across time. And you can add the fragments that you need because the approach is semantics first, syntax second. Here's my most important slide, I think. The higher level view of smart contracts is that a contract is just a logical specification that is just a small piece of a bigger thing, which is your distributed application. Since most of the work is going to happen outside the blockchain, or outside the, the transactions, the, 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 most of the work is not the contract. The contract is just a small part. But the contract is a logical specification. And the lawsuit is just a small part of the contract. It's, well, some, when some, someone fails or does something, we have the lawsuit. And the contract invocation, which is an interaction step in that uh, interactive proof, is a small part of the lawsuit. And the contract the VM operation is a small part of your contract invocation. So, People who focus, most people who do um, formal method fo focus on the last two steps of this, uh, of this thing, which is well, it's fine, someone needs to do that. But there are the two main steps, the two high-level steps that are totally forgotten. I have not seen one person focus on that. And I hope that some, someone here can prove me wrong and show me the papers. I will be uh, very interested in reading them. But people do not understand what contracts are for, by and large. So programming using logic. A programming language is low level when its programs require attention to the irrelevant. Most program, programming languages for contract evocation are way too low level, even those written in functional programming language. The right way to program uh, a, co a contract is to express the variance and invariance of your distributed application in a logical way. And the, the correct program Coring language to write smart contracts will be a DSL based on the appropriate logic, which will be computability logic or a subset of computability logic uh, adapted to blockchain. So, what are low level VMs for contracts for? I mean, we still need a low level VM for our contracts. Well, of course, you should use it, you should use functional programming because it's about logic made computable. But 
what exactly is this logic that is made computable? It's verification of computation. You don't want to do computation, certainly not arbitrary computation. You don't need unbounded recursion. You don't need recursion at all. Recursion can be done by the lawyers of the chain. The judge only sees, hey, here's a miracle proof. OK, I need to recurse uh, on a miracle tree for 64 uh, steps or whatever. Here is a Merkle tree. I look, I find an entry there. It contradicts that entry there. Therefore, the judge can just verify that someone is full of shit or not. And the judge only does, needs verification, no computation. You can have a logic that has only subtraction and no addition, and that will be enough. Only all the constructors should be constant constructors. It's not varistors, it's constructors. And that's all you need. All your um, of course, all the cryptographic primitives of all the blockchains you want to contract about better be there, or, or else it will be very expensive. And you will want to have oracles to access the other blockchains, or, or even your own blockchain. Some blockchains right now make it very hard to access even the state of their own blockchain. So the contracts are hard to write. There's an issue with this uh, contracts writing with logic. What if I have a very long formula, or formula when I translate mechanically for my specification has like hundreds or thousands of alternations between exist and for all? And if you translate function calls naively, that's what you'll have. Well, that means that if you have, say, a two-hour challenge period for each step, a uh, hundred step will take over a week, a uh, thousand step will take three months, that doesn't scale. Lots of things can go bad, and you can be DDoS or whatever in three months. They can send someone to, to hit on your door and unplug your computer. So you don't want that. What you want is to minimize the number of steps and alternations of exist and for all, or sums and products in your, in your formulas. And if there are dichotomies where you need to search, to do an interactive search through a, a long data structure, it's even worse. That means dichotomy, are you going left or right? I show me some data, and then I go left or right, depending on the data you show me. That is very slow, and that will, every dichotomy will add tens of steps to your, tens of steps is like days to your, to your proof. So you want to avoid that. How do you do that? Use columnization. Who, who here has heard of columnization? Oh, that's a long, well, not bad. So Scolem was a logician from the early 20th century who proved things about infinite models of first order series, first order logic series. And what does it have to do with us? Well, one technique he used was a technique to transform predicate calculus to propositional calculus. And a crucial step was transforming, transforming this for all exist into exist for all. So you are going to move all the exist to the left together. And now you have two steps, all the exist all the exists are in one step for one party, all the for all in another step for the other party. And how do you transform a for all exist to exist for, uh, exist for all? You, you use this formula here. A for all x uh, in, in big X, there exists a small y in big Y such that P of xy is equivalent to uh, there, is, there exists an f from x to y that computes. So it's a table that says, whatever you, ch you would challenge me to, here's my answer. And then uh, for all, there is an S, which is for all x, p of x, f of x. I group all the, the exists, and I have all my proofs in two steps max. Two steps. In practice, though, sometimes your index, your, your table of uh, uh, challenge answers can be very, very large. So you may still want to have four steps or six steps instead of just two. But at least it will not be hundreds of steps. What, what will uh, the what will limit you is the size that you need for, uh, to publish those tables. So there's a, a trade-off between space and time. But these, expensive, these big tables are expensive to, to produce, but there's still one good thing. In this case, it's a bad guy who will pay in the end. We know the, the, these processes are decidable. We know the good guy will win. Yes, yeah, sure, someone has to pay for the cost to build this table. But you know what? The bad guy will pay. So, eh, sucks to be him. There are cases where we did third-party litigation. That's, a, that's something that doesn't happen usually in game theory, where usually you have no game semantics, sorry, you have only two players. Here, what if I have this sidechain managed by a manager, Trent, and Alice comes and say, give me $1 million, even though she has only $1 or even no, zero money in there. And Trent, instead of saying, Alice, um, uh, go out, uh, get thrown out of court, you don't have money in my, uh, uh, managed by me, said, straight into it, says, oh yes, here's a million dollar. 
And then all the other customers say, hey, where's our money? It's all gone to this Alice, which is in a Sybil identity of trend. So if, uh, if Alice and trend collude, then they can take all the money away from the contract. But in this case, what we do is anyone who is a member of the contract or not, or a verifier, can offer a counter-argument to Trent. Say, hey, Trent is not arguing his case the right way. Here's a better argument that will win the case where, where Trent's argument is going to lose the case. And then you show that Trent is dishonest. You show that Alice is dishonest. Alice does not get her million, her million dollar. Trent uh, loses his license as a manager for the, for the, for the side chain. Everyone migrates to another side chain. The good guys win. The bad guys lose. So third party litigation, that's something you don't have in human law, where usually to, to argue in court you need an interest in the, in the case, you need to have a standing in the case. So that's the one way that uh, smart contract law differs from human law. And in smart contract law, smart does not mean smart, and contract doesn't mean contract. Smart means automated, and contract just means, well, something from the same analogy above. It's not substitutable to a human contract. So why should you use formal methods? Well, everything I discussed about, uh, previously was relatively obvious if you think in terms of formal methods, and I think it's totally inconceivable without. A lot of people have seen, thought even about contentious as court. Once again, the plasma guys, great, I recommend them. But they, they obviously haven't thought about formal methods, and that's why these things evaded, evaded them. One, so first, just thinking about things the right way. But also because there are lots of moving parts. And if there's the least discrepancy between any of these moving parts, then you are going to lose your money. Because the, the, the greatest specialists in Ethereum smart contracts made a small mistake in the 400 lines of code contract and lost $300 million. I'm not hoping to do better than them and to be more clever than them and to be able to write solidity code be better than them. That's just not, not going to happen. And anyone here who claims that he can do uh, the opposite, well, uh, I will short you if I can, because yeah. no, you are not going to write a smart contract of any length that does anything useful without formal methods and not lose your, your shirt and my shirt and everyone's shirt. And contracts, unlike most parts, cannot be fixed after deployment. Sure, if there's a bug in my server code, I can fix it, hopefully before it's exploited. But if there's a bug in the first smart contract, it's too late. Like, if the bug is there, someone will exploit it. Too late to fix. For short-term smart contracts, maybe you can get uh, away with it. But for long-term smart contracts, certainly you, you lose your shirt. Here are some of the mov moving parts. The logical specification, what you think the contract does. The actual code for the client, the server, the verifiers. The on-chain contract that holds the actors accountable. The on-chain lawyer strategies to invoke the contract when something goes wrong, I need to invoke the correct arguments in front of the judge. The off-chain lawyer strategy to to watch other people, are they doing the right thing, and to advise the user, no, you should not, doing that. You should not do that, you will use your shot if you do. And of course, the tests. Because just because you have proven the thing correct, doesn't mean that it works. You need to constantly test it and, and demonstrate to everyone that, you know, there's this thing work, working in the test net. And every time the, the test tries to cheat, it fails. The bad guys lose all the time. It's, I have not just proven it correct. I have demonstrated it's correct. But you still need the test to correspond to the thing you're, you're, you're specified. If the tests are misspecified, you're testing the wrong thing, actually the bad guys still win. So the solution is to extract everything from the same specification. You write in the domain-specific language your specification of what your dApp should be doing, and you'll extract all these parts from there. And then you can reason about the specification, you can reason about the generation, and you can be reasonably sure that everything is right. Court registry, do we have time? Uh, maybe. So one key component for us in our design is a court registry. What is that? What if I have a black sheep, but it's hidden in a hangar? So Meredith wants to show, a, she knows that something is wrong. She wants to show it the, the black sheep to the judge, but she can't because I'm hiding in the hangar. And in plasma terminology, it's called um, block withholding attack where the manager publishes uh, the hash of the new state of his block of sidechain, but he doesn't publish the content of the hash. So everyone is, hey, wh what's happening? We can't prove that he's dishonest. It doesn't work. So for, for there to be a winning strategy for the good guys, there needs to be shared knowledge. Everyone must be able to see that sidechain. 
Otherwise, the bad guys can win. And for a closed contract with a finite number of participants, that's easy. Everyone can see everything relevant to the side chain. So by, by construction, everyone can always see the elements or argue in court in front of the judge. So if there are two, four, ten, 10, 100 people in the contract, that's easy. Everyone signs everything. But that does not scale for a contract that has 1 million users. You can't have 1 million people constantly on the internet sending each other's message and do 1 million round trips for for every message, or even two round trips because you need a two-phase commit. So that, that just doesn't scale. For an open contract with an arbitrary of number of people who join and leave, you can't use the same strategy. So scaling will be easy, but how do you build the, the, the shared knowledge? Well, the solution is this court registry, which is an oracle for public data availability. An oracle is a system that allows to sign information so that the judge can trust the information. And the judge, the it's not exactly the judge who trusts the information. It's the participants who trust the information and trust the oracle and write the contract and join the contract. And the judge just, hey, you said you trusted this guy. I don't have to trust it. You trust him. And so I, I apply the contract that says it, that, that you trust him. But still, why would the participant trust the oracle? Well, let's report for, for the moment that or, the oracle works and can indeed promise that this data is available. Then. If the data is indeed available, all the third parties, uh, third parties can verify all the transactions on the blockchain, so it will be all honest, and there is no block withholding attack as, as in Plasma. I notice that when I publish the data, I don't need just one pre-image of my hash. I need the pre-image of that hash, but this hash itself has links to content addressed uh, data, so all the links transitively must be present and valid, and, and, um, and present and known and public. So I'm going to publish uh, the, the hash of my Bitcoin chain, and everything recursively and transitively must be public, so that if there's anything wrong anywhere, it can be found out. Court registry, yes, it's not perfect. We have the same issue that every, as everyone else. There is a 50% attack. If you require a quorum of a uh, um, registrar that is too low, then I only need to attack these registrars, that many registrars, and I, I can withhold the block. If uh, the quorum is too high, I can capture the complement of this quorum and deny people registration, and nothing can work. And of course, if my oracle is closed, if I have a fixed number uh, closed system for the oracle, then there is an oligopoly. The, in the long run, the, the, the interest will not be aligned. And if it's too open, that, well, if it's open, it's, it's called a token curated registry, TCR. Well, it means that basically bribing is legal. You can buy the registrar and, uh, and buy your way into cheating. So ideally, you could register, have the code registry on the main chain. But of course, that supposes that the main chain already scales. So maybe when Candida uh, publishes its uh, main chain that scales, we can do everything all the registry on, on the main chain. But until this happens, and until it's cheap, that we need a separate code registry. But there are some good news. Is that this is about shared knowledge and not common knowledge. And shared knowledge is cheaper than common knowledge. Shared knowledge is everyone knows it. Common knowledge is everyone knows that everyone knows that everyone knows, etc. knows it. And what the consensus buys you is common knowledge. And that's why it's slow, because everyone has to agree that everyone agrees, etc. It's intrinsically slow. It takes more steps to build that than just build a step everyone knows it. So with shared knowledge, I can, that's what a gossip network gives you. I can detect double spending. I can detect, hey, this guy claims this. This guy claims that. There, there's a conflict. I don't know yet who will win, but I can immediately know that there's something is wrong. And then when the same guy tries to triple spend, well, no one will give him anything in exchange because, hey, you know what? Something is wrong with your spending. We're not going to, to process you fast. We'll wait for the consensus to see who wins. So shared knowledge gives you protection against triple spending and detection of double spending. And it's much cheaper and much faster than common knowledge. The common knowledge is consensus. It, it can resolve, actually resolve the double spending. But of course, it's much more expensive to build common knowledge than to build shared knowledge. Once we have this court registry in everything, we have our solution, uh, um, which is reputable facilitator, the solution at Legicash. And reputable facilitators are managers for a side chain with an open contract that anyone can join or leave at any time. And because we have this court registry and this contract, everyone can verify the integrity and denounce fraud if the manager does not do his job. Everyone can repudiate 
the side chain and get his money back. Through, so the, the contract is essentially non-custodial. You can exit with your money, even with your, without the cooperation of the manager. You can, anyone can open a rival side chain. So if everyone is too expensive or too slow or whatever, or refuses to process you, you can open your own side chain. You are bonded, so you can't profitably cheat. Yes, you can still double spend and say, get a million dollars out of the thing. But if you are, um, are bonded for $5 million, you get a million dollars, but you lose five, so that you, you have skin in the game. You, you, it's not in your interest to cheat. It's also not in your, in your interest to get hacked by someone who doesn't care that you lose $5 million because they get away with, with a million dollars. But the same problem as, it's same problem as in, in design. And basically, the manager can only do the right thing. The very worst thing he can do is fail to advance, fail to, to process. And if he fails to, 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 to render the service that he promises, everyone just moves to, to someone who doesn't fail. So yes, some managers can fail. Still, a centralized system, the system can fail. But if it fails, anyone can, can take over. And it, it's a free market search competition. And in this case, facilitators can double as mutual verifiers. Now they are interested to not, for the system to not crumble, for the registrars to not uh, fail, because it's not just someone else who gets away with uh, someone else's money. Their money is also going to fail. Everything, they are going to fail if uh, the, um, the system fails. So everyone wants to, to verify each other. So even though you are a random user, uh, one of billions, and you are not professional about computers, you can trust that as long as one of these facilitators is honest, he will watch the others. And as long as the court registry still works, also. Okay, with that we can solve five... Uh, so facilitators are a generic uh, thing, but here we can solve fa fast payment in particular. So fast payment is fast because it's locally centralized. You ask, hey, facilitator, does this payment go through? Yes, in a uh, fraction of a second. You still need to query the shared knowledge gossip network to know if there's a double spending. So you still need to wait for a few seconds for this uh, network to work, but hopefully it can, it can indeed build shared knowledge in, in seven seconds or faster than a credit card works. And in this case, only the floating is unsafe. As long as the thing has been confirmed on the main chain, it's safe. It's only the transactions that are floating that are unsafe. And you can limit that by having every a facilitator drop a bond that is much bigger than the floating that is authorized to, uh, to authorize. So if the facilitator starts authorizing more float, uh, transaction that he, than he should, he's caught, he loses his bond, everything, and everyone distrusts him. Everyone can see that he does the wrong thing because it's on the gossip network. It will still take time to resolve the thing. The consensus is slow, but the, the shared knowledge is fast and allows already to avoid further problem. So merchants still need to trust the facilitators, because if the merchant accepts from a, someone who does the wrong thing, that someone will lose his $5 million, but the merchant will still not receive his $500 payment. So as a merchant, you still need to be um, prudent as to who you choose as accept as a facilitator for fast payment. But there are other reasons you could trust them. They could have a large bond. They could have a street address, so if they do the wrong thing, you can sue them, etc. And that's an opportunity for established financial institutions to have a role in cryptographic uh, payment solutions because, hey, if I'm a financial institution with a street address, I can uh, be more trustworthy for merchants than any random facilitator hidden behind door. Beyond fast payment, we can have distributed applications for non-custodial exchange. We could have, uh, instead of fast, we could do anonymous. You could reproduce Zcash or Mimblewimble on top of a, a side chain. And in the future, you could hopefully develop arbitrary D apps with computability logic. Right now, we're building just very specific D apps just for us using computability logic. But in the future, we'd, we'll have a, a domain specific language for that. And once you have a domain specific language that allows you to build a robust distributed applications, it's not just for cryptocurrency payments or things that involve cryptocurrency, but any distributed application hopefully can be written in a safer and faster and more robust way using computability logic. Conclusion. My take home points are you should take the analogy of consensus at court seriously because it can solve scaling, interoperability, and all kind of issues with distributed applications. And contracts are to not evaluate code on the blockchain. Contract languages also are way too low level, and that includes even the 
excellent, otherwise excellent contract languages that our friends from Cadena have shown us. Way too low level, you should use formal methods. And um, my meta story is that given a problem, you should seek out its essence. What is the essence of a problem? And strip all the incidentals. You should have the ability to reason logically about your problem for machines as well as humans. And then you can match the structure of your computation to the logic of that problem. And that's the essence of functional programming and category theory. And that's why I'm proud to show this talk today at LambdaCon 2018. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes? Uh, no, I have um, a mock written in objective camel uh, plus a bit of solidity to demonstrate the concepts and I'm seeking funding to develop more and right now we are three developing uh, basically a, demo, a technological demo that we hope to be done in a month or two. But we, beyond that we are seeking funding because we believe this is uh, very interesting and we believe this is the way to write digital applications. And so, if you have a few million dollars, I'm a mega beggar. And if you want to see the code, you can register there. We, it's not open yet because we believe that investor, some investors, potential investors, prefer the code not to be public yet. But it will be free software. Okay, sorry, I mean the, the logic system. Logi uh, you can Google uh, computability logic and oh, Georgi Japarizzi. Uh, variant. It's, it will be slightly different. It will be adapted to blockchain. Once again, computability logic is, can prove things about arbitrary number theory or set theory. We're, we're not doing that. We're, we're, all our quantifiers will be about finite data structures which happen to be blockchains or content addressed uh, graphs. Need to prove DAGs. That, uh, Sorry? So you still need to prove that um, the, the logic is still good for your uh, yes. Okay. Yes, but it, it, by construction, the, the, okay. it, it, yes, you, you look what are the games available in front of a consensus judge. There are not that many games available. And here are the operators. You can choose between two branches. You can choose between uh, something that is content addressed and hashed by SHA 256 or whatever the, the hash function is. And you can, you can check, hey, does this record match this hash? Yes, it does. And does that one, can, can we follow this Merkle tree to a record? Does that record say that I have a $1,000 in this account? And then yes, so I claim this $1,000 and here's the, the Merkle tree that proves that I had $1,000 in this account. And now you can either give me the $1,000 or prove that my entry is not the latest. Or that there's a later entry where I spent some of this $1,000. Hey, you spend that $1,000. You are not entitled to it anymore. So you can, you can do things like that. Could the game be infinite? Well, in, in general, in game theory, yeah, in game semantics, yes, but that's not uh, the thing we're interested in. If the game is infinite, it's considered that you, you lose, basically. You, you don't win. And uh, the, the, the game has to be designed. You have to design your contracts and your game such that the good guys win. If your game does not allow the good guy to win, it's a bad game. It's not a game that you should be paying to do on, on the blockchain. Yeah, but it, it's possible to write bad games, but that your uh, we want to provide tools to make it easy to write good games. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yes. So we can hopefully have types and other things that are sure, yes, this, good, this game is good. And actually, th th that's what you want to, to write. Offer only the primitives and with the good games, uh, that makes sense. Other questions? It's perfect to have understood everything. You can implement your own now. Can you show the white sheet? I uh, cannot show any white sheep, so you, you win. <laughs> give, give me two hours. I'll I, I go out and uh, show the sheep. <laughs> yes? So, um, I don't really know, asking me a little about some game semantics. Uh, there is uh, an extension of game semantics where you have uh, team semantics. So you have like a team of people. Yes. That you to sort of reason about so I, I'm not familiar with this part of game semantics, but what I can tell you is that 
we can develop game semantic operators that involve more than two participants. And in, ga in game semantic, we have model, essentially model operators. And the usual model of operators of game semantics assume only two participants, but it's easy to, to, to use other model operators that involve, hey, anyone can counter the proof of this dishonest lawyer. So yes, you, we, need, we will need to add model operators that correspond to what makes sense for a blockchain. So yes, we, we will need to tweak game semantics and to, well, to explore a previously had explored part of game semantics, but it's not, it's not anything like fantastic or conceptually, uh, once you have the idea of doing it, it's straightforward. Yes? You may have already answered this and I just missed it, but uh, what modalities do you need to be incorporating? Uh, incorporate? What, what logical modalities are you going to be incorporating? Uh, think for epistemic logic, so that we have uh, this uh, user knows this key, that user knows that key. Uh, uh, temporal logic, we want to deal with timeout. We want to deal also with the fact that uh, invariants involve involving time. Hey, the, the amount of money in the, in the system does not change with time, or things like that. So epistemic logic, uh, temporal logic, I don't know what else, but we'll find out uh, if we need more. And if you, if, sure whatever you need, as long as you can write a game that involves... Yeah, like I was just yes. curious, like, what's sure. come up so far? Yes. Like, so far, epistemic... That, that was offered in the spirit of exploration. Sure. So, so far, variants of epistemic logic and, model, uh, and uh, temporal logic. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh,